title after Carl, um, and it is a discussion of the discrepancies around Carl Andre's equivalent eight, which is in the collection of Tate. Its description, measurements, provenance, and position within our history. Um, and it's been presented by Echo Chamber. We have Andre de Jong, Andrew Lake, Kathy Wade, and Annika French to, um, to lead the discussion. So, over to you. Thanks very much. Hello, well, thanks for coming. Um, my name is Annika. I'm the editorial manager at This Is Tomorrow, a contemporary art magazine. Um, so, yeah, I'm delighted to have been asked here today to talk to three fantastic artists about all of their kind of collaborative adventures and researching around Carl Andre. Um, so, I am going to start at the beginning and ask you if someone could have a little bit of a chat about how <laughs> the kind of collaboration came about and why you were interested in Carl Andre and his, his work and how that kind of, how it all began really. Uh, well, collab collaboration wise, I, I've worked independently with Kathy and Andrew in the past. Um, Kathy taught me at one point even. Um, uh, and Andrew and myself worked on the Library of Birmingham project when it was moving from the central library to the new library site. Um, that's, I, I guess I'm the common denominator between the three of you, apart from you being Birmingham based artist. Uh, in terms of the interest in Carl's work or how the project came about, it's not necessarily that my interests were in Carl Andre's work, but I'm quite interested in work around that period of the late 60s and early 70s. Um, if, I was, if I was religious, I might describe that time as aus auspicious, because there's, there seemed to be a paradigm shift that was described as a kind of shift from modernism, high modernism to postmodernism. So um, just in kind of doing research in that, I found this anomaly in Carl Andre's Equivalent 8, where the work that he exhibited in 1966 um, differed from the work that he sold to the Tate in 1972, in that the bricks that was exhibited in 1966, there was only one set sold, and he returned all the bricks to the foundry for uh, for these deposit, and when Tate wanted to buy a set from him in '72, um, he had to replace the bricks with a, a lower grade brick. So, for me, there was something interesting about the fact that uh, what I imagine his practice would have been uh, about being very precise and this very kind of dialectically distilled precision about his work. He was willing to su um, supply a, a lower quality brick to the Tate as a substitute for his breath, so I kind of have this idea that equivalent is actually a postmodern piece rather than a, a high modern piece. Um, and in that I had this interest in trying to trace where the brickworks was um, and through various sources I managed to tenuously put together a site that we believe might be the site of the brickworks thanks to um, uh, a scholar by the name of Alistair Ryder who wrote the text for us. Um, and at this point, uh, my interest kind of, we were given the opportunity to do something in New York through SLUS, and um, I begged these two to work with me. Um, and that's how we ended up working together and going to New York and spending 10, 11 days in as what Kathy would describe a bunker. Oh, it was a survivalist bunker. Uh, it was, it was. You closed the doors and it just went pitch black. <laughs> it was also in Slopers Hills, which was kind of enchanting. So that we managed to show a whole load of journeys outwards. But mm. let you continue. Uh, no, I guess that, I don't know if that, does that answer the question yeah, as to how? Perhaps, perhaps following on from that, we could ask um, a bit more about the trip to New York then and what kinds of um, things you were particularly looking for, what things you found, how traces manifested themselves to you or not. I think one of the photographs on the, on the slide <coughs> show is uh, where you believe the site of the brickworks was, the, the colour photograph that's here um, of a kind of... Uh, yeah, the Long Island. Yeah, the Long Island site. Yeah. So, yeah, perhaps you could talk to us... Um, yeah, that one. So that's where you understand that the site of the bricks, uh, you know, the, the manufacturing site was, that's where you 
mm. believe it to be. Yeah, again, mm. tenuous bits of information that I drew from different sources on the internet, but Alistair, who wrote the text, had an interest in this very point as well, and he seemed convinced, I, I, probably a strong word to say, but I think uh, he, he was probably loosely convinced that it might be the right place. So the text that he wrote was based around the idea that the, the brickworks was there, um, and it was just across the Hudson from the UN. So that was one of the, mm. the, 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 the pinpoints that I could find of mm. where the brickworks might have been. Because the brickworks closed down, didn't it? The original one where the, the, the bricks were yes, that's sourced right. from, they, they closed down and then that's why these alternatives were, were put forward. That's right, yes. Mm. Uh, but there's one set that was sold and I believe it's in, in Europe somewhere in Switzerland. Mm. Um, Great. So could you tell us a bit more about um, what kinds of traces you did find other than this kind of, this sort of, sounds like a slightly mythical pilgrimage almost, yeah. um, so what kind of things you found and how you kind of interpreted different materials that are there uh, currently? I think, um, I think we found nothing. Nothing. I mean, <laughs> as in like physically, there was no, yeah. there was no like traces, I mean there was some bricks but there were bricks yeah. that fitted the description of the measurements of the original one, so it's actually, it's a completely redeveloped area. Um, mm. So in the sense of, yeah, things that hinted to the original work, there was nothing there, but then, I don't know, you made more work there, so it's... I did. I so did. maybe you will. No, I mean, I was fascinated because I suppose you got something with Carl Andre in the Quincy book where he hires a press photographer to go out and photograph materials in the landscape and there's something amazing about that because it kind of indicates for him there's this real fascination in just stuff as it is and stuff that he can utilise. So he talks a couple of different points about this kind of interest in these materials and this sense that they start coming into the gallery and they take on a completely different purpose. But then again, I was kind of interested in, I suppose, the potential for this material to be artwork elsewhere. So it was that thing where you go to this site on Long Island and it's just like a commuter park. It's a really strange place and every single surface is shifted, but you've still got these old railway sleepers mm -hmm. and in a way those are materials that he had a specific interest in. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it is a really varnished place. Mm -hmm. But I think it was that sense that that almost led to this belief that you could just record the surfaces that were there almost as a sort of trace or a record of that's what's there mm. at that point. So, yeah. yeah. Would you like to maybe talk a bit more about how you went about recording some of those traces For and sure. the materials that you engaged with? Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of inconsistencies, and I think that was the fascinating thing with the project, that there's inconsistencies in his work in the archives, there's mismeasurements of the work in the archives, there's a kind of belief that, as an artist, it's his responsibility to come and resolve it. So you kind of thought this replacement of one set of bricks with another, another set of materials with a different kind of structure. It was that sense of just thinking there aren't these assurities you know, there isn't this kind of thing that there is a magical solution and there's the brickworks and that's where everything came from. So just the idea of location and surface became really interesting. Mm. So literally my kind of contribution to the work at that point was this kind of sense that if I made one journey across the river, which I kind of hope Carl Andre had done, and I made the journey back, as you kind of assume, somebody in Manhattan might have done to get some mm. bricks because it was an interesting journey. And then literally on index cards just took rubbings of the surfaces that were there in a very, very myopic way for about an hour and a half. Literally in the kind of way where you have people walking over you so you become part of the environment wow. in quite an extreme way, oh kind of covered in graphite. <laughs> Great, so you became part of the service <coughs> number. Oh, for sure. So I should have said that the, the images that are spoken through here are sorted in three layers. So we have images of the publication, which is in uh, Echo Chambers' uh, room downstairs. 
Um, there is also the work that's been shown downstairs, but then also some of the works that were made last year in New York itself. So there's these three kind of iterations of uh, the research and, and making. So the piece that Kathy just held up is, is part of, part of that piece there. Um, so perhaps one of you or several of you could talk a bit more about how you approach these different layers of the project. Um, because making work for a publication is quite a different thing to making work in New York where you don't have your own kind of tools and, totally. and things like that and then how you've approached making work for the, the sluice itself. Um, I suppose I did a slightly different thing in the sense that I made my work in New York before um, but that was because it's a screen print. Mm -hmm. um, but mine came from the research. Before we went to New York, we did research at the Tate, and um, we used the Tate's archives, uh, kind of looking at all the documentation around uh, the acquiring of the bricks, which included obviously conversations between uh, Carl Andre and the collections, and also newspaper collections, etc. Um, so mine, I was interested in the two different sizes of bricks between the original, obviously the original bricks were made and then destroyed, then they were made, remade with a new set of bricks. But with a new set of bricks, there was again a discrepancy between uh, the documents because they didn't match the same documents that the gallery, match the same dimensions the gallery had. Um, so there was this whole to and fro in to the point where Carl Andre had to come to England to then measure the bricks to say, yes, that is a correct brick. Um, so what I became interested in the idea of this object that, you know, as a, you know, a material, it's got value, but as an artwork. Um, once it was acquired, suddenly the measurements had to be important, whereas the measurements weren't important in the first place because they were just standardised bricks. Um, so my piece is almost very literally uh, a screen print of the two different sized bricks um, with the two different measurements which are in the archive. Um, and in the same way that all the sort of, everybody kind of, yeah, so that's it. So all the kind of the, the anti sort of, uh, uh, sort of articles written about the work and um, kind of put it down to the fact that there were these just rectangular forms that had no sign of the artist's hand. So the idea of this work is then sort of screen printed, which is a mechanical process, which is very sort of, you'd argue maybe doesn't have the artist's hand, my artist's hand in it, it kind of directly related. Um, so then getting to New York with this existing screen print, I then sort of made a frame for it using readily available sort of building materials from a local sort of merchant. Sort of in the same way that he used sort of the available sort of um, bricks, which then kind of carried on in the idea that you, the work was left in New York and destroyed in the same way that his was. So then the publication becomes a documentation of destroyed work, mm -hmm. um, and then for here in the same way coming back to London, it seemed logical to remake the work um, with the obvious slight like, discrepancies. This is a new frame. So yeah, the new frames made out of like American sort of Western red cedar, which kind of replicates his idea of using all his early works using cedar wood. Um, and like the blue comes from when it was originally installed, uh, amateur painter sabotaged the work with this blue dye. So this kind of, and it's yeah, processed blue, so it's just a standard blue, which is readily available. So it's all kind of ties into his, yeah, that's my, I'm not sure. So you spoke a little bit about some of the dialogues and correspondences and things in the archive. Mm. Um, perhaps one of you can <coughs> talk a bit about the dialogue between the three of you and how that has sh shaped the work you've made and the project and its formats <laughs> and things. I think what that's so is the one that's fascinating. <laughs> that we, we get back to the yeah, back yeah, bunker here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Bunker. It's all good. Bunker. It was the beauty of the bunker. <laughs> no, I think conversations were the things that shaped the work, and they were fascinating in that stuff became redundant really quickly, or it's like obvious that an idea that one of us had wasn't going to work, or wasn't interesting, or wasn't relevant, or that maybe <clears throat> another approach was. And I think quite often I'm always intrigued by. The idea that if you share a space with somebody for long enough, you have a commonality of materials or you have approaches that swap over. So it's kind of intriguing this time around that the blue tape that you use for the frame, I'm now using as a way of hanging the work. So there are things that just keep moving between the three of us, which mm -hmm. again is intriguing. It is. Lots of visits to 99 cent stores, desperately looking yes. for materials in the States and then being very upset that you can't find the same materials here, having a kind of death. Oh, that's interesting. 
isn't yeah. it? So you're finding approximate copies of materials here mm -hmm. as, as he would have he would have done. Is there, is there anything further that you could say about how um, this like approximation of, or copy or uh, ver these versions of discrepancies and things have kind of come through in the work you've made for SUS or for the publication? I think <coughs> subjectivity is key to a lot of the work that we're making because um, even in the archives the, the two different sets of bricks um, are described in these very subjective terms as a, a bluish white and a yellowy brown so everything we kind of do um, that we've been doing um, again it kind of it has this jarring irony with um, what would have been uh, a practice that would have been all about absolute precision um, that kind of now kind of uh, fizzes out into this very kind of furry edged uh, un undefinable thing that um, you know making something here that I you know I've used standardized materials in New York to make it a grid um, but if I was to remake that grid um, anywhere else a standardized length of uh, two by one would be different so it's uh, it's it's quite subjective in that in that kind of sort of way of un unaltering the, the work and so Andrew's New prints, um, if I may, kind of step in on, on your work, but you were talking about <laughs> the, the the new print, uh, the ink would would have been from a different batch. So yeah, you know, and the amount of yeah screen printing medium mixed with it might be slightly different. Mm. She just I mean you whack off it. So. Mm. It could be slightly so the blue could be very slightly different. Mm. Um, yeah. So will what will happen to the work that you have here? Will that then be how far does the cycle of destruction <laughs> so, sell it to Tate? Perhaps you could talk a bit more um, about materials um, because obviously you have the very specific or or not specific materials that Andre was, was using in these different versions and variations and some of the things um, you spoke a little bit about the kind of blue that you were using but I'm just thinking uh, the, the material that sticks out a little bit for me is your index cards that you mm. were using, which you were things that you had to hand. And um, could you say anything further about about why? I mean, is that connected to this idea of the archive and this records? That seems like yeah. I mean, for sure, you've got that sense of scale. You've got something that's supportable scale, but you've also got this essence of something quite rectangular mm. and quite independent and that was a sort of interesting thing and I think one of the ones that I found fascinating with this sense of what happened with the bricks is this idea I suppose taking a leap is that the bricks when they're returned might have just been returned to be used in buildings mm. so you've got that interesting sense of materials just being materials archiving indexing cards, sort of taking them out of that purpose, making them do something mm -hmm. they're not designed to do. But then that sort of sense of what do you do with them afterwards? Mm -hmm. So the set that we use for that were destroyed at the end of it. So, you know, in a way that recording was, I suppose it just came to a stop. They did their job, mm -hmm. they'd done it. So they're quite disposable in a yeah. way. Mm -hmm. So I suppose I wanted that to come back into the work that's here now, with that kind of sense that that then takes the journey out in the catalogue. Mm. So because you mentioned about the bricks, the, you like the idea that the, the, the bricks, the mythical bricks, mm. might in fact be in buildings and in structures and things. So I suppose that idea is threaded through with your just the, the dissemination of your of your piece here through the publication and so on. That, Oh, for sure. I don't know if any of you have had a chance to have a good look, but this <coughs> piece, this one, that's handy, um, is perforated so that strips can be kind of torn off and, as Cathy was saying, have this kind of, um, they go, go off on their own kind of journeys and things, so that's quite a, quite a nice um, idea and something I was saying to you earlier, Sims, um, kind of interesting in the idea of an art fair and, and then you're kind of yep. distributing your work kind of freely so that's that's quite interesting in itself. Um, could we talk a little bit more, um, if there's anything further to say about, about this, about the discrepancies in measurements and uh, things like that that you found within your 
uh, research at Tate and, and in New York and whether how those ideas have been sort of thrown out in thrown up or thrown out um, in the works. I don't know, maybe you feel like you've talked that through that already, but I think there's a really important one with the measurements because it is that sense of how do you deal with uncertainty and what I found fascinating with Tate was the only person who could resolve this uncertainty is the artist, so in a way it's the artist's responsibility. But the way that that conversation happened and the way it's collected is fascinating because you know he's writing postcards about working class handicrafts they're kind of saying to him, when are you coming to London? And there's this kind of ongoing thing over what feels like maybe about seven or eight years of mm. not having the precise measurements is mm. amazing. I think it's the yep. value of art. It's the, these bricks, this kind of, yeah, tangible value in the sense that the work was destroyed originally because the gallery didn't want to waste storage on a bunch of bricks, which were just standard bricks, essentially. Mm. Nobody brought them. They didn't want to store them, they thought they could put better stuff in their storage. Um, but then in the next few years, his name as an artist increased and then suddenly his work is possibly sellable because he's, yeah. you know, he's a renowned sculptor now. So yeah. in that sense, they remade them. But the fact that he remade them, the work was sent from the gallery to the Tate and it was gone through, it went through all the proper, you know, um, routes. The fact that the measurement was just written down on a piece of paper and it's not that Carl Andre, you know, had the bricks made specific, specific size. You know, it was just a standard brick, mm -hmm. but it was about just that somebody's written down the wrong size, and the, the size never mattered until the point where it was purchased, and suddenly became important once value was mm -hmm. added, and this sort of justification of like it being an original and being the correct piece, and that he was the only one to resolve essentially someone's admin error. Mm -hmm. I think it's maybe the, the interesting thing for me. But that's the wonderful thing is the artist kind of making a corrective gesture of something and I think again that sort of sense of his authorship but at the same time that element that's uncontrollable that you were talking about in terms of materials, mm -hmm. copies, replications, all of those things that I think is intriguing. Yeah, I uh, the, the piece that I made in New York for the exhibition um, I found in the, in the archive that Andre was quite obsessive about mapping out his, his um, exhibitions with gridding the site and then plotting where his works were going to go in the site. So there was, he, he had in his mind this very precise measurement of, of a space to work and how to work with it. Uh, but then I kind of used that idea of the, the grid coming out into the space as the work and then uh, using a kind of solid way of not altering the materials. It, the, the, the grid started doing rude things to the space. Um, it completely ignored the, the window and the, the fireplace. It just did its own thing. Um, what are you saying is you took over the kitchen? I did, yes. It, yes. We, we were in, a, in an unusual um, space in America. Uh, we were um, put up in a, in a domestic gallery, uh, which is the front room kitchen in a front room um, so I kind of I kind of had to deal with what I put artists through a few years ago when I did the same thing in my front room um, uh, so it was it was unusual in that sense that we had to we were transgressing into their personal space and doing things um, that seemed incongruous to a domestic space but I think it all worked out just fine uh, but anyway, so I, was, I, I transgressed. But that, so, so the kind of precise measurement thing for me for Carl Andre was the, was the gridded structure or the gridded format that he always used for doing the layouts of his shows. Um, so it's so I think it was actually important to him measurements, um, not necessarily measurements per se, but actually kind of having some kind of order through gridding mm. the space. And so how does that grid structure run through the show downstairs and are you still...? So in the publication I, I re, re imagined remade the grid as kind of a, I guess a negative of the grid but it also, it 
ignores <clears throat> the the publication format. It kind of again rudely halfway spills or uh, th uh, spills over the, the the spread. It just ignores this publication. It just does its own thing. But it also refers back to um, the Xerox book that Carl Andre did in the 60s where he had little squares kind of accumulating over several pages. Um, but, and then the the work that I made here, again, goes back to kind of using a standardised material. Uh, it was partly a functional piece that I made because we've got a, a big electricity distribution board in our space. Um, so that it was useful to kind of block that off. But then it also works on, on the very obvious level that it's a ubiquitous um, building material and I mean for the last how, how many months, years we've been walking through New Street Station and it's been covered with uh, fireproof plasterboards so I've been seeing pink plasterboards for, for several years now um, I guess it's kind of set, set in my psyche now um, uh, and then just scribbled, annotated on there the, the, the two equivalents that Carl Andre never made so, so the series that he made oh, it goes up to equivalent that he could have done a 9 and 10 or even 9, 10, 11, 12 but each equivalent has two versions of itself um, so it's a kind of completion of the set um, for me uh, I'm not sure he'll, he'll appreciate the way that I did it but it's also uh, an oblique reference back to the kind of um, concrete poetry way of working a very tight delineated space uh, with text um, as much as I can with my crab-like handwriting. <laughs> and your decision is to leave length kind of rough and to have all the, the filler? And... Yes, uh, again it goes back to this this experience of walking through New Street Station mm -hmm. for the last couple of years of uh, just gradually seeing the kind of spaces developing and uh, just these grand, these gestures of, of filler being put over a board and then being sanded back and then made good and painted. Um, I didn't really want to go that far. Um, yeah, There's nothing mm -hmm. too strenuously intellectual about it. <laughs> but they make quite a contrast with the pink, though, don't they? They kind of become, they have their own aesthetic, I suppose. They they're do. Not, yeah. They're not, uh, they're not the marks of a tradesman or a builder in New Street Station. They're you know, that's amazing. Amateur <laughs> slapping it on. <laughs> Definitely. But that kind of returns to that funny echo of all of those cartoons with the potential for people to create art working with their hands, mm -hmm. those manual crafts, manufacturing bricks, those kind of skills mm -hmm. that you see when you're looking at a poster that might have been rolled over or any number of things that kind of create this really fantastic abstraction. Mm. And I think those are moments that become, you know, they're great things to mm. encounter, mm. they are. But I think what I'd say about the stuff at Birmingham New Street is that it's a total Birmingham reference, but that pink plasterboard seems to go on for miles. So you're just exposed to a long series of abstract marks and they are really Picasso when you walk past them. Mm. So they do filter through. And I was amazed as well that they kept changing. So you, you kept thinking that you're going somewhere and you end up at a dead end or being spat out somewhere completely else. So yeah, I think I'm scarred for life by that experience. <laughs> <laughs> well, it would be sad really when it all goes, when all those festivals boards And um, So I guess kind of thinking about the future and um, further iterations of the project, what are your plans next for Echo Chamber and for looking further at Carl Andre? Do you have any ideas for what we might do next? I think, I mean this project summed up. Yep. I think it's, that's my, in a sense it's like, <laughs> it's coming full circle. Um, I mean it's quite absurd in a way to make work about somebody else's work. Um, so in that sense, it's kind of come full circle and come back to, yeah, it's kind of done the opposite of his work, going New York to London, it's kind of, I don't know, some same, yeah, this mm -hmm. idea. It's like that same sort of, and the publication kind of, the text as well, sort of helps kind of finish it off nicely. I think there's some interesting ghosts though, there's some amazing things. One thing we found in the archive is, there was a brick manufacturer up in the northwest 
that had actually written to the Tate to ask if they could borrow Carl Andre's bricks because they wanted to have them in an exhibition about brick manufacture. I kind of thought, in a way, that's an amazing opportunity for something that really, really is. So I don't know whether that is another situation where that no longer exists and there's no possibility, but I think if that did exist, then I don't think any of us should be The brickwork, you mean? Well, I did, I did have a, a spy on, on Street View and I couldn't find find them, to be honest, but... It's all such a disappointment. <laughs> Street View. Um, <laughs> that's how I that's We rebuild out. them, we rebuild them, we just made this living factory. Yeah. I think the course has probably run its course, but there's still the, the original set somewhere in Switzerland, I think someone said, um, that could be worth visiting. And then there's also this, this in, uh, uh, Alistair Reiner that read the text for us. Um, that could be, I don't know, I mean, it's open-ended. Um, I, in terms of us, our collaboration, I think, I don't, no one's come up with any other suggestions at the moment. I think I've put mine on the table. We've done it, so if anyone else has got an idea. So we need to step forward. Yeah, we do. Yeah. Somebody in the audience maybe has an idea too. <laughs> but um, yeah, maybe, I mean, maybe this is a good time to kind of open out and see if anybody does have any questions um, about the work or the publication or the trip or anything like that. I don't know if anyone does have any. Yeah. The, the newspaper article, is that Sullivan? I think it's Nearer. 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 Yeah. So, so how, how do, you, do you now agree with that? <laughs> you know what I love about Archibald? It's quite a destructive part. Yeah. It actually became rubbish, isn't it? The original, like you said, they... they uh, got rid of it, yeah. Of it. Well, he returned it back to the... He went back to the brickwork, so it essentially just went and made buildings of it. But so. there's also that amazing sense of, if you look at that image of the bricks, there's a real sense of considering it. Mm. Turning yeah. out I was side. reading about it, so the reason we got in the paper was like a really odd one, so obviously at the same time Tate was buying stuff equally as like obscure or what you class as not art because of the period, but it was, I suppose what makes sense to do this work now as well is the current economic climate, so it was the period, I've got to get this right, you might need to correct me, like so it was when Labour and government, but the, the whoever it was, Chancellor of the Exchequer, um, was, you what, sorry? Yeah. Yeah, it was, he made the cuts which replicated more like cuts that the Tories were making. So, because he reduced the public spending, um, when the Tate issued their, um, their acquisitions, it was the, it was that sort of announcing of their acquisitions that then led to people seeing, oh, so you've acquired these bricks. So if it wasn't for the cuts that were going on, Politically and sort of economically at the time, and Tate issuing, you know, their sort of spending, then it never would have come out and never become this kind of big, sort of mythical kind of thing. It would have just been brought, put on show, chucked away. No amateur painters would have gone in and got angry that this piece had been bought instead of, like, it would have just been kind of pushed up like a lot of the work. Like, you think, I mean, you go and you think of like the Richard Serra, like the, you know, the works, like things like that. It was all sort of being acquired at the same sort of time. It wasn't like it's really radical, but it just became this thing because of the sort of the political and economic situation. So the fact that we kind of, I suppose, fucked at the moment, like it's the same. It kind of seems right to make these ludicrous works of these. Yeah. Wasn't it acquired? Sorry if you covered it. Wasn't it acquired a couple of years before mm. Neurotic? Yeah, it was so quite so in 72, so but 76 this was published, so that's, that's, I don't think they showed it until yeah, 76 yeah, is when they... Totally, I mean it was very much about display, yeah. and that yeah. kind of idea of this public encounter, yeah. with this seemingly incongruous art, um, you know, but I think there is something really hypnotic about this front page now, yeah. there is, yeah. Just, I mean, yeah. there's something incredible. I think it's kind of... Yeah, ludicrous as well. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's great. I mean, but it is. I really consider that the same thing. It's those kind of dialogues about art. That really is a kind of sense of it's happening with that. And I think it's happening in a way that wasn't really considered in terms of its depth at that point. And you look back at it, and some of those cartoons are really insightful. Yeah. And they're kind of fascinating. 
So you sort of think, in terms of critical response, I think there is something quite unique about that material. It really is. So, no, we need more of it. Anybody else have any comments or questions or anything? I guess, well, thank you for coming along. And um, yeah, we're going to be here for, well, these guys are going to be here for the rest of the week, so <laughs> feel free to have a chat to them about the work further if you'd like to. Thank you. Oh, thank, thank you. you.